Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. As always, you can subscribe, share, and support. You may subscribe wherever you are hearing this with hopefully ears that hear, be it YouTube, Transistor, Apple, or Spotify. You may share the very words of God you hear recited by me and read aloud and or the link to wherever you found this. And you may support at patreon.com slash aksum, A-K-S-U-M. Today we are continuing our journey through the scroll of Romans. Last week we did Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. Today we'll continue with verses 14 to the finish. If you recall last time, there was this idea that the elder shall serve the younger, that Jacob was loved by the Lord, but that Esau was hated. And we saw that we are children of God, we are heirs of God, when we are like Isaac, or he laughs, which is inseparable from Isaac in the original biblical Hebrew, and we are his heirs and children, when like he laughs, when like Isaac, Isaac, we are children of the promise of the law of the Lord, of the word of the Lord. So we'll begin Romans 9, 14 to the end, with 14 to the 18, as we've grown accustomed to the KJV. With my brief uh, interludes, of course, for very terse commentary. Verses 14 to 18. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, I have raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. So remember again, he doesn't do this for you, not because you're different, not because you're unique, not because you're special, but for the sake of his name being declared throughout all of the earth, which the earth and the fullness thereof belong not to you, but to him. Therefore, any land dispute is bonk, it's null, it's void. Instead, here we have a discussion of justice versus mercy, the universal versus the particular, the general versus the specific, the standard versus the exception, the one size fits all versus the case by case, the scenario based, or as we say on the Ephesus School Network, functionality. And the great thing about functionality is that you do not function as a judge. Only one judge functions as a judge, and that is God. He is the arbitrator. He is the decider, meaning only he arbitrates, only he judges. Only he has an opinion that matters. Only he decides. And some, he will harden their heart like Pharaoh. Others, he will have mercy upon. Another interesting point here, and before we move on to verses 19 to 24, Note here in verses 14 to 18 how God and the scripture are used interchangeably. This is one of those things you might just pass by, but if you reflect upon it, it's incredible, it's unbelievable, it's notable, and we don't talk about it enough. I repeat, because repetition is a form of emphasis in ancient culture. God and scripture are used interchangeably here in verses 14 to 18. Let's move on to verses 19 to 24. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? 
of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had a for prepared unto glory? Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. The end result of all of your moral debates that normally have no end, and all of your ethical critiques of God's instruction, is you asking the question, who is God to have mercy on whom he pleases? And this is a ridiculous question that should never be answered, to which the Apostle Paul quotes his father in Scripture, the prophet Isaiah, namely chapters 29 and 45, but you'll see him quote another one later on. The clay and the clay crafter, or the potter, right, is an analogy that should really stick to you. All analogies, all illustrations, all examples, all thought experiments are imperfect. They all break down. They uh, don't patch up, pass up to muster if you really beat them in. But this one is so vivid. It's so realistic. There's so much life in it. And yet it still pales in comparison to the reality. Imagine how silly it is for an inanimate object like clay to lay a critique upon a potter. We as humankind are less than clay to the potter who is God, who is the potter of the heavens and the earth. This is why he makes the decision not only to have Jews who are a random sample population of humankind, but also Gentiles, to include the totality of humankind because he is not limited in his choices to a group of people that he himself chose at another point in time. Verses 25 to 29. As he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah, or Isaiah, also crieth concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth, Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made unto Gomorrah. So he quotes Isaiah again, as I mentioned, this time alongside Hosea. Uh, the KJV says O.Z. and Isaiah, but you get it. And people who are not his people, his people in scare quotes are supposed to be the Jews, Israel. So people who are not that are the Gentiles whom we just discussed. He can decide to make his people because he made his people his people in the first place. That was his decision, his opinion, and his decision and his opinion alone. People who are not beloved, who are not Davidian, Remember that David or Daud means the beloved one. Even in Amharic, let alone Hebrew, wood means expensive, cherished, beloved to this very day. So people who are not beloved, he can make beloved. Again, it goes back to his function as judge, as arbitrator, as decider. So the number of God's household, as we like to deem it, as we like to opine and pontificate over, is irrelevant. It doesn't matter how many people are in your parish or your diocese or your archdiocese or for that matter, your whole church. At one point, the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado Church put out a statement about how we lost some 20 million people. And as that is concerning, the more concerning thing should be not 
how many people are not official members of the EOTC, but how many people are not there reflecting, pausing, and trembling at whether or not they will be chosen by the sole decision of God, whom he has a remnant, witness, prophet, and people of in every time and in every generation. Verses 30 to the end. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness? Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. As we say in the daily prayers of the is right, may he make us unashamed at his second coming. You will be saved. You should have confidence in being saved by God if you place your utmost, your upteenth trust, not in external and outward observations of religiosity or of piety, but when you place that trust in the Lord, who is the Lord of the heavens and of the earth, to whom be the glory and the honor forever and ever. Amen.